Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll get started. I think everybody wants to take a seat. I'm going to switch gears now and talk a bit about uh, some of the data that we're generating from the SQL. And uh, and tomorrow, um, we're just going to start today talking about uh, you know, coming off the sequencer and actually generating some data that we can work with. Uh, there's still a few more steps that need to be done. Um, and then I want to end the day uh, by uh, doing getting a setup for tomorrow's uh, analysis exercises. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, uh, I, I think we set out some pre-work or some things you can do before you came here. So some of you may have, to have had a chance to get uh, Docker installed. Um, if not, uh, the intention today is to go around and make sure everybody has that working on their computers. Ready. You can hide my controls. Yeah, I don't know where I hide them. Except that your Slack is down soon. Slack, I will shut it up. <laughs> there you go. I'm not getting this there you go. Perfect. We'll attend to that later. <laughs> Okay, so uh, sequencing the data. You see in all these these uh, lines here. Uh, actually, I forgot pack bio, although I do have a slide on it. Um, we're really trying to get down to generating data in a common format, FastQ. I'm going to talk a bit a bit more about that uh, data format uh, tomorrow. Uh, but there's a bit of work that still needs to be done uh, from each of these sequencing platforms before we we actually generate those files. That's kind of at the top of our analysis pipelines. So Illumina, um, you know, Bernard's described this in, in great detail. I'm going to focus on this a lot too. This is the, the primary data that we work with um, in, in, in the genomics uh, program. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're doing imaging of, of tiles with Illumina uh, flow cells. Here's a kind of representation of a flow cell here. Um, and you see this little area here is a single image that's taken. So you know what, what's happening is is every time a cycle goes by, every time as we do sequencing by synthesis and new bases are introduced, there's photos taken, uh, high resolution photos taken all across the flow cell across all these tiles. And within one of these tiles, you can see each cluster, which ideally represents a single uh, fragment of DNA that was captured and amplified, um, is rep represented many times across that tile. Um, so multiple multiple images are taken uh, with each cycle, and then and after with each new cycle, a whole bunch of images are taken, and the instrument computer is analyzing this as it comes off. Um, so a cluster again is a, a region that represents a single DNA uh, molecule that's been amplified, um, and it's important that these cluster locations are maintained across the images as we look across them. So um, what we see here is kind of a false color image. Showing um, with the with the the four base the introduction of the four bases, we 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 take an image um, and you can see the different colors represent a different base put together into a composite image here. Um, what happens on the Illumina instrument is th these are analyzed as they're produced, generating uh, what's called a BCL file, a binary base call file. Um, each file represents one tile at one cycle, and that information. Uh, contains both uh, a, a base call and uh, uh, um, an assessment of the quality of the base call. So if we look at the Illumina flow cells, and Bernard showed this very briefly, uh, but there's been kind of a, an evolution of the chemistry. The, the, the initial chemistry was what I've kind of showed on this slide here with the introduction of the four bases in four different colors. And so each base had its own color. Um, and four images were taken uh, with each cycle, four different dyes, four images per cycle. They've now evolved that and, and it continues to evolve uh, to, to move from four dyes to using only two dyes. And the intention or the, the, the approach here is really to, to have one dye associated with uh, cetazine, one with thymidine, um, and to have both dyes associated with uh, adenosine. And for G, it's, uh, there's no dye at all, so it's just kind of a dark cycle that goes by. The reasons for doing this um, is it's cheaper uh, um, and it's faster. Uh, we get less images per cycle, um, less free agents coming in as well. As well, there's been some evolution in the, the way the flow is also set up. Um, it, the initial flow cells were uh, kind of a slide where, where all the DNA would 
attached in random locations across the flow. So it was kind of a bed of, of primers put across it. You put your, your, your DNA on it and they were just random locations. Um, and that resulted in a lot of analysis that required figuring out where these clusters were and defining them and kind of maintaining that image across slide, slide from slide. Um, and there's always a the potential that clusters would overlap. Um, so it was very important to, to kind of have the correct cluster density. You don't want to have too, too, too dense of, uh, of, of, a, of an overlay of clusters because uh, you'll run into problems with trying to identify um, them from each other. You don't want to have it too, uh, um, what's the opposite of not dense, too sparse. Uh, um, too sparse either because you're just waste, wasting real estate on that slide. Uh, in, in recent years, the, the, the current sequencers, most of them are using pattern flow cells. So here the cluster positions are predetermined. That's brought in a lot of solutions to some issues that came up with the, uh, the, the random flow cells. Uh, it's also brought in a few issues that had to be addressed as well. So what do we do? Um, I mentioned we, we generate these BCL files coming off the images. That's a series of files. Again, each file represented here with the gray box um, is basically a, a, a representation of what's on the tile at that, at that cycle. Um, and that information is basically transformed uh, into uh, a, what we call a FASTQ file. I'm gonna explain that in more detail tomorrow. Um, but basically going from one image per cycle to all those cycles being represented as a sequence of bases across here. Um, Bernard also mentioned er earlier the idea of demultiplexing. This is the step where that's happening as well. We, we have index sequences that are also sequenced that identify the sample. At this point here, we're using that information to say these bases at this position or this cluster, and I'm showing that cluster carried across all the tile, is demultiplexed into this sample here, uh, was it, whereas this one here is actually associated with this sample here. And the data separated out. We may have, you know, it's going to vary depending on the flow cell and the capacity. You know, you could have a, a dozen samples on a, on a flow cell. You could have, you know, 100 samples on a flow cell, um, even more with the higher capacity. Um, and, and of course, it's important very much that the index sequences, as Bernard pointed out, uh, are very distinct from each other. So that's kind of the process we go through um, when we want to actually generate the data that we're going to work with. And that's, that's again, stored in a, a format, which I'll, I'll describe in more detail tomorrow. Um, other sequencers, I'm not going to spend as much time on with the detail, but there's similar processes that are happening there. You're going from data that's generated on the sequencer into some kind of raw format and trying to bring it out into something that's common between all platforms um, and, and useful for downstream analysis. Brian Torrent, um, again, we have that idea that um, we're, we're capturing signal uh, from, the, from changes in pH. That's kind of measured as traces. And there's a lot of uh, software on the instruments that take those traces, do analysis on it, and bring it down to base calls again. Um, this is actually showing it into, uh, into an alignment. I'll talk about that tomorrow more, um, but getting the base calls in a similar way. Uh, Oxford Nanopore, it's a, it's a bit more complicated. This is a, a technology that doesn't do any, um, uh, it's not sequencing by synthesis. It's basically uh, DNA being pulled through a pore and causing a change in signal. Uh, this also generates uh, a lot of raw data, um, kind of looking at traces of, of, of what's happening over time. And that needs to be converted into base calls as well. Uh, some terminology, they use different terminology on, on, on what they call their files and how they generate things um, and the software that they use, which I'm not going to go into detail on, but I just want to point it out that it's different than Illumina, uh, different than Ion Torrent um, um, and how it's done. Um, and we're basically going from signal again to sequence data. Uh, there's a lot of machine learning happening on here as well. It's a complicated algorithm to kind of, to kind of convert that information into a, into a base call. Uh, so there's a computation that's a lot more intensive on this, this, this instrument. And finally, I'll just mention uh, PacBio. Uh, this is also a uh, sequencing by synthesis, uh, but we're not kind of capturing it on a, on a substrate in the same way. We're looking at uh, wells holding these, these constructs, um, and we're measuring signal from the fluorophores as well. Um, it's a real-time uh, base calling that's happening as each base is incorporated. Um, it's kind of a signal that's kind of shown here and instantly converted over to a, a, a base call. 
Uh, one interesting um, uh, feature of the PAC Bio platform is this idea of a circular consensus sequence where the long, long fragment is captured in this kind of hairpin structure and the sequence acts, sequencing actually happens multiple times. So, so what we end up with is the ability to basically do some kind of consensus calling at this point, helps with error correction in these long sequences. Okay, that's a kind of a brief outline of what's, what's, what's going on with the different platforms. Uh, again, appreciate that they're all very different and how they have to kind of do the analysis, but we're all getting to the same point. Are producing FASTQ files that are the same format. There's going to be differences, to be honest, between the different platforms in terms of what the quality scores, what the information means in those FASTQ files. Um, but it is a common format that we can move forward with analysis. Any questions on that? Is it going to switch switch gears and talk about the what we're going to do in the next um, in the next day mostly and get getting ourselves set up. So what I'd like to do for the analysis section, my intention is to give everybody an opportunity to kind of play with some of the tools and do some of the things that we do um, when running analysis and looking at some of the data uh, that we look at and understanding uh, a lot of the different file formats that we work with um, when we work with sequencing data. What I'm showing here is a kind of a complicated pipeline that we run uh, as part of the genomics program. Um, and it actually leads into our clinical reporting pipeline, which Ian is going to talk about later tomorrow. Um, there's a lot going on here. It's a whole genome transcriptome pipeline. That means we sequence a, a whole genome um, tumor, a tumor with whole genome sequence libraries, and we do a match normal. At the same time, we also prepare uh, for RNA-seq whole transcriptome data. Each of these, uh, once we generate data off the, off the sequencer from each of these, it goes through a number of steps in the pipeline. Some of it uh, using the whole genome and tumor together, um, first going through alignments and then through a bunch of variant callers, um, whereas the whole transcriptome is also processed um, independently uh, from these. And they do converge at some point with some, some, some of the workflows uh, that kind of take this information pulling it all together um, and trying to create certain information uh, that's used by our clinical reporting. Plus also it's, I mean, uh, it's used by our clinical reporting. We run this pipeline, uh, not just for, for the clinical reports, we do a lot of research work for it as well. Um, it, uh, as Bernard mentioned, it's an accredited lab. The pipelines are all accredited, validated, tested as well. And while they were, that work was mostly done for clinical reporting, um, these pipelines are also used for our research. Uh, people who come do research here, or do sequencing here for the research projects, uh, are able to work with an accredited pipeline. Um, again, a lot, a lot going on here. We're not going to talk about all of this. I wanted to give you kind of an idea of the whole scope of it to kind of play with all these different tools and try these different things. We'll take a bit more, quite a bit more than, than just tomorrow. Um, so I am going to cut it down um, to a smaller set. Of analysis. I'll jump ahead here. And we're really just going to focus on one part of that pipeline. Um, and we're going to bring this through from beginning to end, starting with raw data, uh, doing alignments against the reference genome. And I'll talk about that more in more detail. Um, and then once we've done those alignments, we could do some pre-processing, some cleanup of the data, uh, then running a, a tool to do generate somatic variant calls and following that up with uh, annotation uh, of those variant calls information that's important for the downstream uh, uh, review processes. So where do we do analysis? Um, most of the software that's being developed for doing this type of work has been developed on, uh, on Unix operating systems. Um, and I mean, we all work with you know, some version of that. Um, Mac has uh, a nice terminal program that's very much like uh, Unix-like, Linux systems as well. I think Windows also has Linux emulators. PowerShell, I understand, is very much uh, Linux-like as well. Um, I'm not sure what computers you're using, but we should be able to do this type of work on all of them. Again, we're going to rely on something called Docker, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, a few things about the analysis is the data is large. Uh, we're going to work with smaller data. Um, we can't work with the, the type of data sets that we normally work with. Um, it just won't, we don't do that on laptops. Um, what's 
what's required because the data is so large, you do need a very performant file system, um, something that can handle large files, moving large files around, so fast network connections. Again, a lot of our data that we generate, but we don't have the ability to even back it up. It's too big. Um, and so it is, it's really important to have redundancy on your file systems as well. Uh, systems that are built up with multiple hard drives that if one drive fails, uh, that data is kind of exists someplace else as well. Um, most of our work at this point is done on a computational cluster. Uh, you know, going back to the kind of the complexity of this pipeline, you can see a lot of things are run in parallel at the same time. Uh, we're running many, many cases, many samples at the same time. So we take advantage of, uh, of an HPC system that we have at uh, on-premise here at, um, at OSCR uh, to basically run, run many, many jobs at the same time, set jobs off, let them run and come back and look at them later on. Lots of monitoring, making sure everything's working properly. Um, there's ability to kind of do this in cloud as well, uh, Amazon, Google Cloud, it's all kind of HPC systems up there, uh, gives you a place to kind of work with that stuff if you don't have your own uh, systems on premise. And I mentioned as well, there's, there's just some, you know, graphic interfaces for, for working with this type of data and running this type of analysis. I mentioned the Galaxy project, which you can take a look at. They have a lot of kind of click and, you know, picking things and doing things. To run your analysis. Um, it's good for playing around with the data. It's good for analysis as well, depending on what you're doing. Um, if you're working with smaller genomes, especially. Um, and Lumina Base Space has a similar thing uh, as well. Uh, if you're working with their data, you can put, put it directly up into Base Space and run a lot of the routines um, in, in that location. And it's got a lot more point and click. It's a bit easier to work with. Uh, but really, all these things kind of are doing this in the back end. I mean, it's, it's running software mostly on, on Unix based systems. Um, let's say where we're going to, I'm going to show you on the next day. And that comes us to the analysis pipeline. So we're going to run uh, tools uh, on the command line, kind of look at how we go from a uh, raw sequence to a line sequence. Um, but the reality is we, you know, we don't have people doing that here. We are writing routines, we're writing pipelines, so we could basically launch these things from beginning to end um, without, without human intervention, it's a lot of monitoring, making sure things are running properly, a lot of dealing with failures or issues that might come up, uh, but in no way is somebody kind of sitting here and doing each of these things day by day um, as we go by it, as, as we burn through it. Um, yeah, and these are, I mean, you know, making the point here, these are very long running jobs sometimes when you're working with uh, ADX or EX whole genome, um, it could take days for it to get through the processing. Uh, a lot of our effort in terms of pipeline development is trying to find ways to optimize it, improve it, make it go faster. Uh, we have a big emphasis right now on trying to reduce the overall turnaround time for our, our clinical um, reporting. Um, and there is a lot of effort going on with our pipelines to try to reduce as much as possible how long it takes to process. Um, and uh, I just mentioned on that as well, too, that our pipeline, our pipelines are actually built in a system called Cromwell Whittle. Um, there's a number of different systems that are set up. It's kind of a standardization of how you write a pipeline. Um, you know, I think earlier on, people would kind of write their own uh, ways of, of, of automating things. Now, a lot of it's standardized. Uh, NextFlow in particular is, 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 is doing quite well, especially in cloud-based work. A lot of people are writing stuff in NextFlow. Uh, we work in a system that was developed out of the Broad Institute uh, using a, a workflow engine called Cromwell uh, and building workflows in Whittle. Um, and another engine that people use is called SnakeMake. Uh, all kind of doing the same thing in different ways, but all with the same purpose to kind of allow you to run something as big as this, um, you know, just kind of set it off and let it run. Okay. So how are we going to work uh, through some of this stuff? We're going to use something called Docker, uh, and, and hopefully uh, everyone has a chance to take a look at this and download Docker Desktop. What is this exactly? Um, this is a system to basically create an environment where you could do analysis um, on your own computer, where everything is set up in a Docker container, Docker image, which we're going to turn into a container. Okay, uh, it works on all platforms: Mac, Linux, Windows. I think that's all there is. I hope nobody has something other than that. Um, it, it provides a GUI to work with. We're, we're gonna work mostly on the command line, 
uh, but it will let you do management of your containers and even run some stuff uh, through the through the graphic interface. Um, we're going to, I mean, what I will show you is kind of working on your own terminal on your computer, but there's ways to do it through the interface as well too. Um, and that's what I'm talking about here. It does provide a command line tool uh, for working with containers. So what this basically is, is somebody somewhere has said, well, I need this software and I need, need to let people run it. I'm going to put it into a container and build an image from it. They do that on a computer someplace else. They will do uh, installation of uh, the software, all the dependencies. And this is this is not always easy. I mean, if you want to install software on your computer, you know, people do this all the time. A lot of the software that we use, it's, it's difficult to install. There's a lot of system libraries, a lot of things that are needed by the system before you can run it even. Um, and if you're not doing it properly, it won't work properly um, or it won't install at all. So this is kind of done by people. They get it working, they build it, and they create an image. Uh, it sits, sits in a place called Docker Hub and, and, and where anyone can really come in, find it, pull it down, and use those images. They do different things. And we see two different people on their personal computers pulling those images down um, and making use of them by building containers, uh, which will basically have like a little computer um, in, in, in a Docker container where you can run whatever is available there. The, 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 the emphasis here is usually when you build an image, you build a container, you do you put in only what's really needed. there. You don't want to bloat it up with a whole bunch of software doing a whole bunch of different things. It has a specific purpose. We'll pull those down. We'll run things through them for a different purpose. We'll probably use, we'll use a different container to do something else. And you'll see that as we go through the exercises. For data, uh, we're going to work with this nice data set coming out of NIST in the US uh, called Cancer Genome in a Bottle. Um, they've basically uh, uh, sequenced um, in a whole bunch of different ways. If you take a look at this chart down here, you can see the short read sequencing, long read sequencing. They've done single cell, uh, high C, um, you know, some other technologies here as well. Um, um, on all, a lot of different platforms as well. You see Illumina in here, uh, Illumina uh, a few times, PacBio, uh, newer Ultima, um, um, Nanopore as well, PacBio. Um, this data set, it consists of a, a tumor cell line, um, referred to HG008-T, and a match normal. Unfortunately, no, no whole transcriptome with this. I'm hoping that will come soon, uh, but we're going to work with some of these data sets. And this, is, this data is fairly large. Um, I'll come to the uh, document that I've, 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 I've generated, which I've shared with everybody, uh, where I put links to where to find this information. Um, you can go, anyone can go down and download this. It's, it's freely available. Um, I've pulled it down, uh, but I'm not distributing all the data because, again, it's large. Um, it's going to take a good, good deal of space on your computer if you want to try to process it. It's going to take a lot of time. So I've basically taken the raw sequence data. Um, some of the aligned sequencing data, and I've cut it down to a very small size that we can kind of run through some programs and, and, and see what happens. Uh, the specific data set I'm using is an Illumina data set, uh, a short reads short read from Illumina uh, that was generated at uh, BCM, um, which includes one of the normals and uh, the term tumor. Sequence to 195X and 169X. That's the coverage, and I'll talk a bit Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about file formats. Um, throughout the lecture, I'm going to talk about different, different file formats that we use for bioinformatics analysis. Uh, we'll start talking about sequencing data, which is stored in FASTQ format, and FASTA for storing reference data. Uh, talk about generating FASTQC reports. Uh, then I'll switch over to talk about mapping to a, a reference genome, uh, a little bit of time on that and the tools that we use. And then again, coming back to talk about the file formats that are generated and giving you some details on what those files look like, what's in them, and how we use them. Um, we'll do, we'll do the, we're going to do all of this before the break, so push the break to the end here, because then I'll talk about doing some pre-processing, using some other tools, um, and doing somatic varying and calling. The intention, again, as I mentioned yesterday, with the exercises, is that we work through this uh, somatic uh, calling uh, workflow, uh, from beginning to end, not the big analysis with the, the, the full flow chart that I showed, but just really this one part of it. Okay, so file formats, how we store uh, genomic information. 
Um, it, yeah, there's a standardization to how, how this is done. Um, it allows people to kind of work in a common ground, allows software to kind of understand what it's going to get when it pulls that information in. Most of these file formats will have very detailed specifications about how they should be organized, what information should be in those files, and what all that information uh, means. I've, I've put a number of links throughout the lecture, uh, bringing you to the specifications. Some of them are quite long, um, but you know we can use them to kind of understand what's, what's in our files. Uh, I'm gonna talk about basics, uh, what we see in most of them. Uh, the intention is most of the stuff is, most of the files we create, they're human readable versus machine readable. Um, we do wanna have it organized in a way that we can have software read it and work with it. Um, we, also may, we also often take these files and we compress them. They can be very, very large. Um, so compressing then makes them smaller, easier to move around, easier to work with. And there's a lot of tools that are designed to work with the compressed files. So we don't actually have to decompress them to work with them. Um, in addition, uh, a lot of the file, file formats will also be indexed. Uh, basically taking what the information in the file, creating an index so we can have software that can find that information that we want in those files. Um, so for instance, a specific genomic location we just, we're just really just interested to understand what's happening there uh, by having an index, the software that can use that information to quickly find that and pull it out for you. Um, and there's a number of different tools which I'm going to go through today to talk about uh, manipulating and working with these files. So first, I'm going to start with FASTA format. Um, this is kind of basically for storing nucleotide sequences. It's very simple. Um, and, and you'll see this for reference sequences. You'll see this for sequences you may pull down from online databases, for instance, I'm, I'm, I made a link here to a FASTA report for the, for the uh, BRCA1 gene sequence uh, through NCDI. If you click on, on there, you'll come, come to, to their site and you'll see the, the actual sequence of that gene. It's basically just organized with an identifier and a sequence. The identifier is preceded by this, this, this um, forward arrow with a, a name, and then the sequence follows. Uh, this, this actually got reformatted. Uh, there's no space here. This should be on two separate lines. Um, the idea here is that after the, the introduction of the, the identifier, you can have as many lines as you want showing the sequence. Usually, usually it's either one long line or multiple lines all of the same length, but it really doesn't matter. It's just, it's just looking for, for sequence information that follows it. And it'll take everything uh, that follows the identifier as associated with that identifier. Uh, so I kind of have just kind of a little cartoon here showing you know, chromosome one, chromosome two, and some sequence under it. Obviously, this would be much, much bigger um, for each chromosome. Um, and you can also include uh, characters besides the ACGT that we're used to, uh, and characters indicating we're not sure what the base is at that position, and a lot of these IUPAC characters uh, indicating some ambiguity. I put a quick chart here to indicate what they, they all mean. Purines, pyrimidines, uh, Jesus sees ATs, different things like that. We don't often see those in the files, but they can be used um, in some applications to use more often than others. And uh, just coming back to the header, uh, it can contain a lot of information. You often see a lot of information describing things that are in there. It's really just this first part. As soon as you hit a space, that's, that's really just extra info there. It's that first first part of it, that's the identifier for the sequence, how the sequence is referred to. So in this case here, it's uh, MT, which is actually stands for mitochondria. This is mitochondrial DNA. So that's, that, that's how we store kind of long sequences, reference sequences, information about what's in a gene, what's in a genome, et cetera. When we're working with sequencing data, though, we've that, that's actually been adjusted to work with another format called FASTQ. The Q really just for including quality scores. Because when we, we work with sequencing data, we're not only interested in the sequencing uh, or, or the, the, the basis, but we're also in, interested in having some kind of assessment of the quality, how confident are we are that those base, the base calls are correct. Uh, so this is called FASTQ format. Um, and it's actually a four line format. And uh, again, my formatting has gone off. I can see here, I think I can fix this quickly. Okay, uh, so this, this, is, this is a four line format. So each record, each read that we've sequenced is represented by four lines. The first the first line is an identifier uh, with an with a with a with an ampersand it begins with, and it's basically a, an identifier of some sort that describes 
uh, the read. In Illumina sequencing, we talked about that, that kind of appearing in tiles and images. It's usually a position on the flow cell, X, Y coordinates, a tile number, things like that. There's a lot of detail. Illumina actually puts a lot of information, including like a, a, an instrument model, uh, an instrument run. It stores a lot of information that's that's in there, but it can be anything. So it's not, it's, you know, unless you're writing something very specific for the sequence uh, uh, information, you know, it, it really is just a name for the sequence. That's followed by uh, the read itself, which is again going to be just the HECT. You could have ends in there, um, IPAC scores as well too, um, and that you know that will represent how many cycles you've done on the sequencer. Um, usually, with a, a sequencing we're doing right now, it's about 150 bases per read, but there are varying lengths that are done. Um, uh, I'm just kind of showing a shorter span right here. Uh, the third line in the four line record is just simple plus. There could be information in here as well, other identifiers, but really this is just a separator to indicate that I finished giving my read, my, my sequence. Uh, it's, it's finished and the last line is gonna be the quality score. And that's a, that's a, that's a, an encoded information that gives you an idea of the quality for each base. It's represented in such a way so we have a one-to-one -one representation of each base having a quality. And I'm going to explain these quality scores, these encoding values. Okay, it's, it's, it's kind of a simple uh, approach. Uh, Bernard kind of talked about uh, uh, error rates and what we, what we, we look at. Um, you know, basically, we're trying to assess uh, the probability that we've made a, a mistake in, in calling the base, right? If we have high confidence, you know, kind of working with a, a value of one in 10,000, probability of making uh, an incorrect base call. Um, and I'm rep representing that, that, that here is the error, the probability of the error expressed as a, a, a ratio and as a percentage, okay? Um, and that, that value is basically transformed into a value uh, with a very simple log formula. Uh, so that a 40 represents a one in 10,000 chance of a, an error. Um, a, 10, uh, a 10 represents a one in 10 chance of an error. To bring this into the into the FASTQ file, then we further in, take this value here, which we call a thread quality, um, and we map it to an ASCII table, just characters. And I'm showing that mapping down here. So a represent, rep, 40 would be represented by a value over, well, sorry, it's, it's, a, a quality score of 40 is actually adjusted to 73 and map over here to the letter I. So under this scheme, the letter I in a FASTQ file indicates a quality score of 40, which is a one in 10,000 chance of uh, being incorrect. And, you know, just, just to get some perspective here, you know, when we're saying one in 10,000 chance that we made an incorrect base call, um, that seems like it's, it's very small, uh, very unlikely we're gonna have errors, but realize we're sequencing hundreds of millions of bases. So there's gonna be errors in your data. Um, you know, each individual base has a one in 10,000 chance, but if you look over the, the hundreds of millions of bases that we're sequencing, there's going to be some missed calls. Um, and just a quick chart, uh, kind of show how that's, that, 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 that those quality scores are generated. This is going to vary very much by platform. Um, this is kind of the Illumina scheme here. Um, everybody kind of has their own encoding and determination of probability. They're basically looking at, you know, we talked about how Illumina data is processed to, to, to base calls. It's basically looking at these profiles of all the different colors. You see regions here where it's very clear peaks at, at specific cycles of what base is being called. In this case, a red is a T, I think, um, and those are very high confidence, right? But then you get into other areas when you look at the, 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 the colors that are generated, and there's a lot of noise, a lot of mix up, whatever else generating much lower confidence scores as well. The, the bars on here are kind of showing the quality score that's that's generated at all these positions. You know, you see areas here with kind of low background noise, here with a lot of background noise, confidence is less. You get cases where I mentioned N being representing of a, of a, of a base that can't be called um, at this point here, for whatever reason, it just can't make any base call with any certainty. So it just places an N. And just to kind of emphasize that again, what I really just mentioned, you see the, uh, again, this is, my formatting is a bit wrong, it should be on a separate line, uh, but the I, which is the fourth base, C, represents a base quality score of 40, or one in 10,000 chance of a, a missed call. So 
So when we come back around uh, to the exercises, um, and again, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not gonna pause right now. We're gonna go through the slides first, and we're gonna come back to this. We're gonna take a look at some of the FASTQ files that, that I, I, I've generated uh, and made available to you. Those are very small FASTQ files. Um, I, I've, I've taken just a small portion of the data that was downloaded from Genome in a Bottle, um, just to kind of give you something you can work with on your computers, and we can kind of you know, run through some software and take a look at. We'll also come back and generate some FASTQC reports with a, with a, a, a container uh, that contains the program FASTQC. Uh, it's an HTML report, which we can look at and give, some, give us some basic statistics and metrics about the quality of the data in our FASTQ file. We'll, we'll come back to these slides when we come to the exercises. Uh, the FASTQC report that we'll look at, um, it, it, it's, it's basically generating a bunch of statistics um, related to the reads without really kind of knowing what those reads are, or how they relate to the genome, just kind of looking at the data itself. Um, what we're interested in there is getting, you know, basic statistics on what's in the file, uh, how many reads we're seeing, um, length of the reads, things like that. Uh, and then we create a lot of images in here. I'm not going to go through the FASTQC report. We'll do that. Um, uh, well, maybe I can do it right now because I have some examples here. Let me open one of these. Here's one example of our FASTQC report. This is taken from one of the data sets uh, that I generated. Um, it shows a number of plots here, the per base sequence call quality. So we see along the cycles, this is 151 bases that were sequenced. We have high quality all along, a uh, value of 36. Uh, it kind of dips down a bit towards the end. Bernard mentioned that yesterday, that quality tends to, to with, with short read sequencing, the longer you go, quality falls. That's why it's short reads, because you can't get quality uh, calls after a certain length. Um, we see a bit of a small drop over here. Um, and there's other metrics looking at the tile, uh, the quality across the tiles. It gives you an opportunity to kind of see if there's something Funky going on with your, your, your flow cell, whether you know some tiles are, are, are behaving very well. And generally that, that, that looks good. You don't see issues with it. Um, the per sequence quality score, which is just a histogram. Again, most of the sequences in this in this read, uh, sorry, in this file are, are uh, very high quality base calls. Um, so the distribution shows a peak at 36. Um, per base sequencing se sequence content. So you know what we expect if we're just sequencing the whole genome. We're going to see a mix of A's, G's, and T's at each position. But overall, the distribution is, is, is very, very, very regular, very normal. Uh, we see uh, um, you know, higher AT content, low GC content in this case here. And because of the pairing AT, GC, we, we generally see A and T go together in GC. Uh, GC content is, is kind of a metric that's often used to kind of understand uh, quality issues. Um, it, it, could, it, could, it could help with understanding a lot of other things as well. So this is just a distribution of the GC content at about 35% peaking here. Uh, how much end content we have, how much missed call bases, um, a sequence length distribution in this file. Everything is 151 bases, so it just peaks there. Um, we, may, we, we may end up with uh, variable read lengths uh, not so much with Illumina. Illumina, you will uh, generally get everything the same read length, but if we do some processing of the data, we may trim, cut parts off, and we'll get changes there. Um, duplication levels, we're going to talk a lot more about duplication a bit later. If there's overrepresented sequences, some kind of noise in there as well, as well as adapter. Illumina, uh, Bernard mentioned uh, adapters um, and issues with adapters, um, and, and especially uh, primary dimers, getting into those but you may get contamination of adapters in your sequence uh, data, and that's something you can, you can look at here as well. And I think I'm just gonna go, uh, I'm gonna show you another report quickly with another data set I generated. Okay, this was actually a data set I generated from the original data set, but I just enriched it for all those sequences in there that have adapter, okay? There is adapter contamination across the whole thing. I've enriched this, this file to kind of show you what the fast QC report would look like if you're seeing a lot of adapter in there. Um, and yeah, you see a lot of changes. Suddenly we go from, you know, where we saw very high quality across the whole thing. Well, I'll come back up to the top of the other one, All right? You know, so we're seeing, you know, lower quality scores in that, that, that later end. Uh, that's partially because of the adapter, more likely because we're doing read through past the adapter and getting a lot of noise. 
Um, and it kind of results in some issues in poor tile quality. You see that there as well. Uh, if we look at the quality scores here, we've got a shift where everything is high quality to a lot of noise in here as well. Um, we're seeing that all along. The, the messy profiles in here indicate something's going on. Uh, GC content, and I'll come down over to over here. We looked at the overrepresented sequences and adapter contamination in the original file. In the enriched file, we see definite appearance of some of these lumen adapters, um, both on this profile and this profile. Um, you know, the reality though is, you know, with with fast QC, it's a type of type of uh, we we run it on all of our data. Um, we don't we don't have somebody looking at each of these reports trying to figure things out or trying to understand stuff. We 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 have things automated through our pipelines. They will pull into this data. They'll raise flags if we see issues. Often though, uh, if we do get you know something coming out of the data, something that doesn't look right, that's you know that's kind of funny. We're not sure what's going on. These are things that are generated. You go back to and take a look at and see if, if, if something in there tells us what why we may be seeing something that we're not expecting. Okay, uh, a bit about adaptive contamination then. Um, you know, Bernard talked about this. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an issue. Um, it, it's, it's worthwhile spending some time cleaning up your data before you actually align it to the reference sequence. Um, why this happens, um, you know, Bernard mentioned primer dimers basically capturing no fragments at all, and you're basically just getting it after only an adapter. That's an issue, and that's usually dealt with at the sequencing uh, by excluding those, um, you know, based, based on size of, of the molecules that you're you're uh, here from. Uh, but you do still get adapter in your sequences, and that usually happens when you have short reads, your short fragments that are captured. And so normally we will we will have a fragment, we capture, we put a primer on, we read into it from both ends, and we get sequence from both ends of that fragment. If we have very short reads, uh, short fragments that we're capturing, then our reads may actually go past into that adapter sequence, and we get that noise in there as well. Um, and there's tools to, to, to deal with that. Again, I'm sure to the fast QC report, there's ways of detecting it and saying it's there. There's ways of doing some processing on the fast Q data uh, to clean it up. And we have an exercise uh, for that as well, too, using a tool called Cut Adapt with what we're expecting to be the adapter sequences. We can give uh, those adapter sequences to that tool. It will go through and clean up our reads, cutting off uh, that information. If it finds it's all adapter, it'll just get rid of those reads altogether. Um, and what we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll do through the exercise that shows you those fast QC reports that were generated on that adapter contaminated sequence. After we clean it up, we could run another fast QC report, and we'll see that a lot of that's been cleaned up. Those adapters should have disappeared. And commands for running that, which we'll come back to. And I won't show the fast QC reports right now. We'll move forward. Then. Okay, so now we have our sequence data in FASTQ format, uh, and we want to take those reads and we want to map them to a genomic reference. What we're trying to do here is basically say we have uh, a genome, this is bulk sequencing, we have a whole bunch of cells, we've isolated all their genomes, we've prepared them for sequencing, and we've sequenced that information. We now want to know all those reads that we've generated, where do they come from in the genome? Can we get them back to a location where we can kind of map them back and then look at what's happening within those reads at those specific locations? So we're going to work with the genomic reference. That'll be in FASTA format. Uh, we'll, we'll prepare it for, for mapping. Um, and we're going to take each of those reads in the FASTQ file and, and, and map it to a position. Generally, the mapper is trying to find the best position to put a read. Um, there's, there's, there's certain uh, restrictions on it. If it can't find a best position, it will find, it, it, you know, and by best position, it may not be a perfect mapping. By best position, it may not be the correct position, okay? It, it, it doesn't know what the correct position is. It's just trying to take sequence and trying to say, I'm going to map it to location. At some point, it can't find any position that really works and it won't map those reads. So we will, we will end up reads that don't get mapped, okay? Uh, so it really is, you know, dependent on our, our reference. In the exercises, um, uh, we're going to do mapping to, to make the exercises work faster. Um, I've limited the reference sequence just to chromosome 22 of the human genome. It's much smaller. It's the smallest chromosome, uh, smallest autosomal chromosome. Um, 
And um, uh, you know, it, it just it just for so that we can kind of run through these quickly. But what we will find is that it's it, it's still going to try to map all your reads to it, even if they're not from chromosome twenty two. So we will get mismapping in that in, in, in those cases. Um, and it's an important point to make that that's how the mappers work. They don't know where it's coming from. They're just trying to figure out where the best place to place it is. You can have mapping to multiple locations too, and sometimes that's 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 fully valid because that 151 base sequence is seen at multiple locations in the genome. Um, there's a lot of repetitive uh, uh, sequences in the genome, so that's, that's that, 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 again, that's expected. This is often why we, you know, we develop the long read technologies to kind of deal with the fact that short reads don't always map accurately. Um, yeah, and, 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 and when we do our mapping, you know, we're not expecting perfect mapping. Uh, you know, if we get perfect mapping, that's really an indication that our sequence has no errors in it. Mostly, uh, that our sequence has no errors in it. That there's also no variation between that sequence and the reference read. But we do expect their mapping not to be perfect, and that may happen because of sequencing errors, which we have to account for, biological variation, mutations, etc. So you know, the mappers aren't designed to say. 100% identity between the read and the reference sequence. But what's, again, what's the best I can get? Um, and, you know, it also uh, provides uh, a confidence on how good that position is. Um, yeah, and again, contamination sample may result in reads not getting mapped um, as well, things just not getting represented in the reference. I put a link here as well. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how these algorithms developed. A lot of the work that's been done in developing mapping algorithms really is focused on trying to do it quickly. It's a very, it, you know, you can do this in a very naive ways, and it can take you a very long time to try to map these to a genome. Um, so a lot of the work has been developed around how to prepare your, your reference sequence for, for aligning and how to run it in ways uh, that are going to do it quickly and efficiently. And I'll just mention here, we, 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 we generally do, you know, with the, with the work we're doing, we're taking uh, mapping approaches. There are other approaches to working with sequencing data. Instead of mapping to a reference, you basically just do an assembly. Uh, you take all the small reads that you've got, and you kind of look out the overlap between them, and so you basically build up uh, a, a genome. That, that, that's complicated with, with short reads. It can be done. A lot of local assembly work is done with some of the tools uh, to kind of do that type of work. But really, if you're trying to assemble uh, a full genome, you really need to kind of do a combination of short reads and long reads, which we're not doing with the limited technology. Okay, so reference sequence uh, or genome builds. Uh, it's, yeah, they're basically collected as FASTA files, uh, represents, represents the sequences. Uh, it'll be kind of broken up by, by chromosome. Um, there's been an evolution in reference sequences. Uh, we're currently using uh, this version here, HD38, for many years. The uh, HG19 uh, version released in 2002. That was kind of the completion of the completion of the human genome. And that's it wasn't totally complete. It was really actually about 93 percent of the genome was was complete. Um, that was released in 2002. Many years we used that. Uh, about 10 years ago, they came up with an improved reference, uh, which is referred to as GRCH38, which is HG38. Um, a bit more of the human genome is in there as well. Uh, a lot more accurate information was put there in there as well. That's what we're currently using for most of the work we're doing here. But there's been further developments on it, um, which we've not migrated over to yet, mostly because a lot of the support work of annotation, finding information about what's on those new builds um, is becoming more and more available. Uh, the most exciting thing was this thing called T2T, telomere to telomere. This was released just a couple of years ago. And this really is kind of the, 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 the point of having 100% of the human genome. They, they, they've sequenced all of it. The difficulty, uh, as I've kind of alluded to a few times, was really dealing with short read technology and all these um, rep huge repetitive regions in the genome. Uh, as we developed the long read technology, we were able to attack that. Um, and they finally have done a full uh, uh, release of, of the full complete 100% human genome. Um, and I think this is from a single individual. I think they have versions that are kind of collections from multiple individuals, which they put together into a reference. Moving forward, we're coming up with these ideas of map-based references. So with all these references, when we map to it, we're basically taking 
something that we've created and calling it truth. It would, you know, this is what we want to map it to. We want to look for changes against that 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 truth set. But that truth set is really represents one person or a couple of people. You know, composite of a couple of people. You know, and the reality is, I mean, everybody has a different genome, so we're just looking for differences uh, to that. Um, with map-based references, it's a different approach, uh, and this is still developing. Um, it's basically taking uh, building a genome that not only has the beginning to end sequence, but accounts for all the variation that we know about that might exist as well. So, you know, normal human variation, variation should already be represented in there. Uh, a lot of the mutations associated with cancer, say, uh, will be represented in there as well. Um, and you know what we're really moving towards, which I think is very interesting, is personalized references, especially for cancer work. It's interesting. The idea is that we take a sample from a person, we build up a reference based on what their germline DNA looks like, and then we can take uh, we could we can do sequencing of their cancers um, and compare it to that. The reference genomes are freely available. Um, you can go down and download them. I downloaded. The full genome, uh, as I mentioned, I pulled up chromosome 22, uh, which is set it up to work, work with in the exercises. Um, okay, so let's talk about, about mapping. Um, and I want to talk about paradigm data. Illumina has a, a you know, it's, it's a great design in terms of pulling a fragment out and working with paradigm data. Uh, and it's often used to rescue uh, reads. I mentioned reads can align in multiple locations at times. And I'm showing you kind of a, a representation here of a single read mapping perfectly at three different locations, right? The advantage of, of having paired reads, uh, where we're mapping both ends of the fragment, is that we take the other end of that second read that exists. And you'll see with all the FASTQ files, they always come in a pair, read one and read two, okay? And we can map that as well. And we can see that maps in this example here at just a single location. That gives us a very clear indication because we know what the rough fragment size is. We're, we're going from about maybe 250 to 400 base pairs. Um, which is not represented here, but you know that. But, that, but, but working with that pair gives us a clear indication that this read here, which maps at several locations, really is coming from this location right here. Um, and that's you know we kind of use the, the, the data in that way to get better mapping uh, of, of reads against the reference. And as I mentioned, we're not expecting perfect alignments uh, of the data. Uh, in some cases, we do see that. Represented here, you may have mismatches uh, with a single base uh, difference here that could represent a sequencing error, that could represent a mutation, or it could represent just normal variation uh, that exists between uh, the person who's been sequenced and what what what, it, what exists in that reference. Um, things like in a, a small insertion, uh, suddenly we have to kind of introduce, we have an extra base introduced here that's not seen in the reference genome, uh, or small deletions, we're missing some bases. Uh, in the read uh, that are in the reference genome. Um, and sometimes our reads, some of the tools will take the reads and map them against multiple regions. This one's being split uh, across, uh, and it's represented by two alignment records in our file. Um, you know, and there's an indication that, you know, something's going on, you know, for some reason, this read is mapping in two, two distinct locations. Perhaps there's some kind of alteration in our genome that's kind of brought that information together, maybe a huge deletion or a, uh, a, a translocation of some sort, you know, things of that nature. Bernard's also talked a lot about uh, the necessity to get a, a certain coverage depth. I think we're, our human genomes, we're doing 80x in the tumor, uh, 30x in the match normal. Um, coverage is important. Uh, if we had 100% accuracy, no sequencing errors, it would make it less necessary to get uh, uh, high coverage, but it's still needed for other reasons as well. Um, let's skip this slide, there we go. Um, you know, so here's one indication here. Um, you know, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing different depths of coverage, you know, with these reads here, I've indicated what the depth is, although I think my slide has shifted again. Um, you know, and we're seeing a, a case here with, you know, a, a single base uh, mismatch in one of the reads, right? So, you know, when we, when we look at this, and, you know, I suppose that was, you know, an 80x uh, depth, that, you know, when we're seeing a single base mismatch in just one read, that's a pretty good indication that's probably a sequencing error um, when we can account for that. And downstream tools will account for that as well. It can also be an indication, you know, especially if we're working with cancer genomes and we're working in a low purity sample, um, that we have a mix of, of, of 
tumor normal in there, potentially, you know, different tumor uh, origins in there as well, too. So it could be, you know, represent a very low frequency variant. Um, you know, and what we will often see, especially when we're working with germline data, germline data, you know, we'll see variation kind of represented across all the reads, um, uh, suggesting that this is a, a variant, um, a, a homozygous variant. Uh, this is shifted. Um, and, you know, we look at that 50% versus 100% uh, tells us whether it's a one, one, one half of the variant. Coverage depth is also important to help us understand uh, copy number variations. There's, 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 there's copy, copies of genes are often made, um, especially in the tumors, uh, or copies of whole chromosomes, things like that. By looking at coverage depth um, across regions, across chromosomes, we get an indication of what those, you know, what that what would be happening there. This is this is kind of a toy example, but imagine this kind of spreading over much larger regions. It's really an indication that depending on what we're using as a baseline, there's a doubling or uh, adding of the, 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 the these locations, these, these genes at this location, or the genome, or maybe a full chromosome. So, you know, just to emphasize the point, this is really why we're, we're, we are insisting on doing the short reads, you know, hitting minimal depth of coverage, because we really need that to, to understand what's happening at those positions. And so in the exercises, we'll come uh, to using a tool called BWA, uh, and we're going to take some of the past Q files uh, that I've made available. Um, I've actually prepared the reference with chromosome 22. BWA, will, you know, is also needed to actually prep that reference, make it ready for alignment. Um, and I put instructions on how to do that yourself, um, but, but that's already been prepared as well. So we can take that, use that tool and actually do a mapping to the reference. And once we do that, we're gonna take those fast Q files, map them to a reference, and we're gonna save that information in a different file format, um, which I'll come to right now. Um, that's called SAM format. I'm gonna talk about two, two, two more file formats uh, in this lecture. These are ones that are very commonly used. At the end, I'll kind of mention a whole bunch of other formats, uh, file types we see and we use, but these are kind of things that, you know, kind of every day we really work with. Um, so the SAM format is, is, is storing a lot of information about the map reads. It has information about the read itself, location where it maps, uh, gives information about how it's mapping, how it's aligning to that reference. Um, and of course, it's gonna carry over from that FASTQ file, both the sequence of the read and a quality string um, that, 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 that exists in the FASTQ file. There's a nice document here. It's a long document talking about the specification with lots of details on all the different things that, that are, are, are shown in that format and how to put information in there. Um, I'll talk a bit of detail about some specific features of that format. So first part is uh, SAM format includes a header section. Before we actually talk about the reads, I'm showing that in red. It's kind of just information, every, every line in the header, and it, it's at the top of the file, uh, is preceded by an ampersand uh, with some codes to indicate different information. Um, go to the next slide. Yeah, okay, which I'm showing here. Yeah, and, and that header then is followed by, followed by um, the records, which I'll describe in more detail, and there'll be one record Generally, one record per read. Uh, you may have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you may have reads that are split for some reason, and they'll generate multiple records. So the header fields, um, important things that are in here are the sequence information, what you're aligning against. It'll tell you what, what, what you've aligned against. Uh, this should be chromosome four. Um, one important feature of it is identifying read groups. Um, the information that's in a BAM file may come from multiple sequencing runs. We often combine it together, but we really want to know where it came from. Um, and this is a very important field that's included to kind of show the provenance of, of where that data came from that's now in that BAM file. Um, and it is used downstream by a lot of programs, especially uh, uh, for duplicate marking uh, for a lot of variant calling as well, too. We have identifiers in there to indicate what that data is associated with. Um, and then some, these, this PG uh, prefix is really just, it's a it's nice self-contained file. When you generate it, it will generally capture all the commands that were used to generate it. And the intention there is that it exists in the file. If you want to know how that file was created, that information should hopefully all be there. You can review that and look at it. 
Uh, uh, regroup fields, I mentioned the regroup, um, I'm just listing them here. Uh, it, you know, there's actually a lot of fields that could be included, uh, but things that were commonly included is the name of the library that we've generated, the name of the sample um, where that library was generated from, plus details about the sequencing center um, and the platform that was used. There's an ID attached to the regroup field. Um, that ID will be on each record in, for, for the sequence data uh, to kind of, kind of indicate which ones, which, which regroups associated with this. The alignment record itself, um, I'm showing it here. It's a column, uh, a tabular format. Um, it, we start with the query name, which is the read identifier. This usually comes out of the FASTQ file. Uh, a flag, which indicates a, a number of different things about, about that sequence, which I'm going to talk about. It's, a, it's, a, it's this kind of a binary bitwise flag, it's called. Uh, I'll explain what that is. Where it's aligned to, in this case, chromosome 19 at this position. Uh, there's an indication of mapping quality. This is very much tool dependent. Uh, BWA will generate a mapping quality. Another program will generate a mapping quality. It may not mean exactly the same thing, but it's meant to give a confidence on, on, on the quality of the alignment. Sometimes the uniqueness of the alignment too. If you have something that's mapping everywhere, it may get low quality scores saying I can't really map this down in one location. Uh, this is very simple here, but it's, it can be quite complicated. It's called a cigar string, which I'll describe. In this case, it's saying that this, this, this sequence is 76 bases long and they align perfectly. There may be mismatches in there, but there's no insertions, no deletions. It's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping of, of the 76 bases to the reference. Um, then there's some information here that kind of relates to other records in the file, basically trying to pair this one up, this read up with the, the other pair. So when we're doing paradigm reads, uh, both ends of the fragment, we do want to kind of identify where the other one exists in here. And that's kind of encoded in this information here, talking about the template length, which is the fragment length, um, and where the, the other read is located at. Um, and then we carry over from the FASTQ file, as I mentioned, both the sequence and the quality. So I think it's like 10, 12 columns here. Um, there may be optional tags as well. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, you can read the same specification. Different software will use them in different ways to indicate additional information that's not encoded into this, this information here. So a couple um, details on this. I mentioned this second column here, this bitwise flag. That's really capturing some basic information about the, um, uh, about the read and its association with the pair um, and maybe with other reads as well. Um, and it's basically creating a uh, kind of a doubling one, two, four, eight, sixteen value for each of these descriptors of that that mapping of that read. Um, and basically, you know, anything that's kind of checked off. In this case, I kind of marked off that it's uh, the read is a paired read. Um, it's in a proper pair. A proper pair really kind of describes two reads that are within a certain distance of each other. You know, you could have two reads mapping to totally different locations in the genome. That's not that, that's not unexpected. We, we, we're having short fragments. We expect them to be within a certain distance of each other, a certain orientation as well. Uh, so the read could be marked as being part of a proper pair. Uh, in this case, it could it looks at the 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 other other pair, uh, the, the, the other the mate, uh, the other read in the pair, um, where that's mapping to um, marks if the read is the first or the second in the pair. So we basically mark off these flags here. Um, and by adding up the scores associated, uh, the, the flags with, with, with those, with those uh, designations, we get a value here of 99, and that's what will get stored up in this column here. Um, we're all very happy that somebody had put this page together for us. Um, and it's a nice tool you can go into. You can throw in a flag, um, it'll tell you exactly what it means, or you can come here and check off things that you're, you're interested in and find out what that score looks like as well. Of course, a lot of tools downstream uh, will look at this flag as well in terms of doing the analysis. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I talked about tiles yesterday. Um, let's come back to the... On the alumina sequence, right? So, so this is this is a, this is an alumina flow sim. 
Um, and basically images are taken across the whole flow cell. Each image in includes clusters. So there's, there's, there's hundreds of images that are taken with each cycle that goes by. Um, and that's what, that's, what, that's what's referred to as a tile. Yeah. And you know, part of the QC and the past QC tool is to kind of look and see if representation of, of issues or, or noise is uniform across the tiles or if it's happening. If for some reason we saw, you know, there's one set of tiles down here where there's a lot of error, a lot of noise, that tells us maybe something's wrong with our flow cells and our flow sequencing itself. Other questions? Okay, the other, the other feature I'll mention about the BAM file is the cigar string. I'm just going to go back and show briefly. Represented right here, this is a very simple string. Again, I mentioned this is an indication that uh, 76 bases are kind of mapped one to one against the reference. Uh, but it can be quite complex what this cigar string looks like. If we take a sequence and we kind of map it against the reference, you'll see there's you know, there's a gap put in here, there's a mismatch happening here, there's some um, a gap happening here in the reference, or the, so this is the reference in the read itself to kind of force that alignment, okay? Whether this is the true alignment or not, it's hard to say this is what was mapped, but we want to we want to indicate how it mapped, and that's indicated with this string. It's basically just kind of saying what's happening in each position and being a, either one-to-one -one mapping, it could be a mismatch, however, which we see here, again, still called an M, um, where there's insertions happening, uh, where there's deletions happening, uh, resulting from the, from the read itself. And that's just kind of summarized by kind of counting them up and representing it like this, in this case, 4M2, I8, M3, D3, M. Uh, so that's four matches, two, two I insertions, another eight with a mapping, matching, uh, another three with a deletion, we also have stuff like areas that are skipped, um, soft clipping as well. Uh, sometimes it will take a read and just say, I'm not going to map the end portion of it because it's not mapping well at all. Maybe it's adapter that, that got through, it doesn't map. Uh, so it may just do a soft clipping and that'll be indicated in the soft in the string as well. Uh, so it's like I said, 10s at the end of the read. The last 10 reads, I didn't bother a lot. Okay, so that's that's SAM format. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some, some SAM files, but we're gonna look at them in BAM format. So, so data again is large. Um, we, wanna, we wanna reduce it as much as possible. Uh, this is generally not stored in text format, but stored in a binary format, uh, simply called BAM for binary SAM. Um, makes, this file, it makes the file smaller. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier on, we index that sequence, uh, so index that file. Uh, so we can find things very quickly in it. Um, and there's a very popular tool called SAM Tools, um, which is used, and we'll go through some examples of, of working with that in the exercises uh, to basically, you know, search for information in those BAM files and pull them out very, very quickly. So when we come to the exercises, um, we're, we're going to have generated some BAM files. I've pre-generated some as well already. Uh, we can look at SAM tools to, to, to look at them. We're also going to look at IGB, um, which is a, kind of a, a, an interface where we can kind of load that information up and take a look at it. Um, and we can also use SAM tools to generate a lot of metrics on the BAM file itself as well. Okay. So I'm going to jump over to this. Um, I'm going to come back to these slides when we, get, when we come and talk about using IGB because I've got some detail on how to work with it. Uh, I'm going to move ahead. Uh, I, what I am mentioning here, though, is you know, we are going to use this tool called IGB, Integrative Genome Viewer. That's not the only tool for looking at uh, this data. Uh, there's a lot of online tools, a lot of other browsers that are available. UCSC, uh, uh, University of uh, California in Santa Cruz, has a very nice online browser where you can actually take your own data and put it up there. Um, kind of in, a, in, a, in kind of its own environment, um, and look at you know the 
the, the region generated uh, kind of mapped into the genome um, and show lots of other information about what's happening at those genome, genome locations as well. We could do it with IGV as well too. All these tools kind of do similar things, maybe you know, in, in different ways. Um, Galaxy, which I mentioned as kind of a GUI project, has its own tool for doing that. Um, and I mentioned these ones as well. But we're gonna come back a bit later and look at IGV. Okay, so we've gone from raw sequence data with quality scores generated in FASTQ files. Uh, we've now taken that data and we've aligned it to a reference sequence. What we're really interested in though is to try, try to understand the variation that's happening between those reads and the reference sequence. Um, we're not quite there yet though. Um, one thing that's been mentioned a few times is the issue of duplicate reads. Uh, this is a, this is, this is not, Unique to Illumina sequencing, but it is an issue with Illumina sequencing, especially with short read technologies. Because um, our intention really is that each read should be, each genome that we're sampling from, or each location in that genome, should really only be represented once in our data. Um, we're pulling from a, DNA from a whole bunch of different cells, a whole bunch of different genomes, but we don't want to see you know, some kind of bias happening here, where for some reason, all the information in one cell, we're, we're kind of seeing that over and over again, something to that effect. Um, and that's called duplication. Uh, uh, it, it rises, especially um, with the PrEP stages and library PrEP, because we're doing PCR. We're amplifying our DNA to get enough of it that can actually run through these reactions and generate libraries. Um, and because of doing that, um, you know, Bernard, Bernard mentioned there's a number of methods that are PCR free. That's part of the reason they do that. Um, uh, but when we do kind of do that step, and it happens both in the prep of the library, it happens on, on, on the flow cells itself, um, you may get uh, the same molecule being sequenced, uh, a representation of the same molecule at the same site being sequenced more than once. We want to be able to catch that and kind of clean that information up. I'll show you some of the reasons why you want to do that. Um, it also arises from, from the Illumina technology itself. Um, I, I mentioned kind of yesterday, talking about pattern and in, 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 uh, not pattern flow cells. The original flow cells were basically random locations where these clusters were forming. Um, sometimes it was hard to, difficult to kind of determine where one cluster begins, when one, when one ends. And sometimes you may have you know, multiple clusters, uh, which really are just one, but you're calling it twice. Um, so that could get into your data as well. As we moved away from uh, non-pattern flow cells, from random flow cells to pattern flow cells, that issue went away. But other issues arose that you know, kind of resulted in these pattern flow cells with small wells also you know, generating duplicate reads. Um, and there's kind of another factor here too. We're basically talking about both ends, uh, you know, the information can be moved from, from complementary strands, uh, both being represented. Uh, some people filter that out, some don't. Um, we don't need to go into all the details on here, just to kind of indicate in the places where duplicate reads may come from. And what, you know, the, just to kind of emphasize the, the issue with it, you know, if, uh, what I've done here is I've marked several reads as being duplicates. Um, this is what we will do with some of our software. Um, if we look at the original data, we see about a 50% representation of, of this uh, single base mutation here from C to a T. Once we've marked those reads as duplicate and we've cleaned it up, we see that only happens once. Maybe it's more likely to be a, a, a sequencing error than anything else. But somehow got um, amplified um, with multiple reads and represented more than we want. So how do we, de how do we detect duplicates? Um, so traditionally, the way to detect duplicates is really to take that paradigm reads and say, where does it map? And you kind of, you kind of see uh, the reads map, um, kind of showing the mapping of the reads here and then kind of ordering it. And we see that this set of, uh, of read pairs all map at the same beginning and end locations. It's kind of a simplistic approach. And it says, it's, you know, and the idea is that it's very unlikely, yes, It, 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 we don't, but we're trying. We're, we're, we're trying to. Uh, uh, well, so, so we talk about a heterozygote. We're talking about base changes, differences between the reads, because really what we're looking for in duplication 
is that the reads we've generated are coming from a unique genome. So it's a different issue than, than, than talking about the variation that we're actually seeing. Okay. Really, again, what we're trying to get at is that, you know, did these these read these read pairs all map to the same locations beginning to end okay is that because at an early stage we pulled out a fragment and we did pcr amplification and we're looking at the same copy coming from the same genome twice okay that's the question that we're trying to deal with here okay um and again the simplistic approach is really just to say look at the beginning and end. Um, if they're mapping to the same location then it's likely that they're duplicates it's not 100 percent sure that they're duplicates but it's more than likely based on a lot of factors in terms of how much reads we're generating, how big our data is, et cetera. Um, but there is there's, there's an opportunity that, that these, you know, these may actually come from different genomes. Um, um, and we're still gonna mark them as duplicates anyhow, just to clean up the data. We, clean up, we, we, we may lose a bit of information at the, uh, uh, we, we gain a lot by marking duplicates and getting rid of some of that noise at the expense of potentially losing some information. Uh, Bernard mentioned uh, yesterday UMI approaches. It's kind of a slightly different approach. It uses the same strategy, but when we actually do the sequencing, um, with every read, we put a small identifier on there at a very early stage. So that when that does get amplified, that UMI gets amplified as well, right? And here you see the same representation here with uh, these four sets of reads, uh, all kind of mapping to the same locations. Traditionally, we would just mark them all as duplicates. With that additional UMI information, um, we can say, well, this one is actually not a duplicate of the other ones. You can kind of exclude that. And we just mark these as, as duplicates here. This is really valuable, especially when we're doing very high depth sequencing, uh, where we're looking for very, for very, very, very small, um, um, uh, small frequency variation uh, that may exist. And you know, the higher depth we do, the more likely we are to get duplication, duplicate reads in there, so it helps us to really determine uh, what, what's a true duplicate and what's not a true duplicate. And the other great advantage of it, and this is really true with for very high depth sequencing, um, is that it also gives us an opportunity to do something called error correction. We can look across these reads and say, well, these are all duplicates. They should all have the same information. If for some reason there's a sequencing error in one, we can, we, but we're not seeing it in the others. Likely we, we know, but we know, we, we know with more confidence that that's likely a sequencing error. And we can kind of do correction on that data as well. There's a, the, 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 this is an example of pre-process, something we do with our BAM file before we actually do a variant column. There's other things that are done as well. I'm not going to get into details uh, of all the other things that can be done, but a lot of kind of preparation of that, that alignment before we, we, we actually do somatic calling. And this, is, this one is really important, um, and, and a lot of the downstream callers insist that you have duplicates marked before that proceed. The one we're going to use, WeTech2, um, will be looking for duplicates. So um, we'll come through some exercises to, in, in, in the material I shared for doing duplicate marking with a tool called uh, GATK, and a container we're calling GATK. Um, and then we'll come around to running um, UTEC2 uh, for variant calling, uh, which will take our, at this point, what we're gonna do, we're gonna run both our tumor and our normal pair together through this tool. Uh, it's going to use the normal as background uh, and try to identify variants in the tumor, uh, and then follow up with filtering that uh, that that file to kind of indicate um, which are true true calls and which are, are likely just noise. And that's going to take us to the fourth, the last format I'm going to talk about in detail, which is the VCF file. So we've captured sequence information in FASTQ format, we've captured alignment information in SAM and BAM format. Varying information we're going to capture in something called a VCF file. Um, it's, a, it's a tab separated file. Again, they, they do get big, so they're generally compressed. And like the BAM, they contain a header um, and then records for each variant that's found. The header can be extensive, and I'll show you some of the header information that's in there because it represents different things inside the, the data. Uh, and here's the, the specification for it. It's an it's a even longer document, right, the SAM specification. Um, I'm going to come back to what's in the header in a minute and talk about what the different fields. There's basically I think 10 columns are represented, 10 or more columns represented here. Okay. Again, it's each, each one is, is identifying a variant um, and giving you information about that, what it's seeing in the data. Okay. Um, we have a given chromosome and a position where that variant is located. Uh, sometimes it includes an identifier, it's a known variant, especially. Um, 
That's kind of stored in online databases that can be carried over to here. Um, then it'll tell you what the, the, the sequence is at the reference, reference position and what you're seeing in your read. In this case, we have an A converting to a T. And in the bottom case, we have what's probably a deletion, a TC, and we're only seeing it represented as a T in the read. Um, um, we also may have multiple alternate alleles that are going to come up for whatever reason. Um, and here we have the reference to the C. That's it's actually seeing in some reads it's seeing an A, and some, some reads it's seeing a T. Um, there's a quality value associated with it. Um, there's a filter field. Um, here they're all marked as pass, but they're giving information in here and giving other things. Um, and then information about the variant, uh, about the variant calling at that position. Um, this is indicating the depth that we're seeing across all, all the samples at that position. Um, and then the final columns um, really represent what's happening in each sample. A PCF file can contain multiple samples. Um, they often do. Um, each one will be represented by a column. And the fields in that column are defined in this format field, and the values are represented under each sample column. I'll show some, some examples of that. Um, so just coming back to some of the tags I mentioned, this is coming out of the headers, it's complex, but some of the things that may be in the info tag is again, it's the depth, um, whether it's a somatic variant or not, um, something about consequences, which comes from a tool called VAP, which I'll talk about, um, you know, different things like that. The way the BCF files is set up, any information that you're gonna find in your records should be referenced in the header. So you can go up to the header and find out, you know, what, what does this DP mean? What does GQ mean? That'll all be up in that header information. It's meant to be self-contained, um, so you have all the information in there. Um, the format tags, which again come for these columns here, um, will uh, indicate a number of different things. Uh, depth of the individual alleles, the overall depth, uh, quality score, um, also stuff, remember I talked about doing a assembly versus uh, alignment. Uh, Mutech 2 and, and some of the GATK tools we'll talk about, uh, they do this thing called local assembly. We'll take some of the reads and try to kind of paste them together in small regions. And that's really useful for looking at haplotypes um, and trying to look at phase versus unphase. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, important field that's seen here is the genotype field is basically a column that's happening here. So looking at some examples, um, which I kind of sh showed in the other uh, um, representation a minute ago, showing reference and alt, um, we see kind of a, 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 a base substitution, a couple of base substitutions here. Um, um, but then we have this indication of genotype here, GT, um, which is either indicated as unfazed or phased, uh, and uses a slightly different character, a slash here, versus kind of a, a, a vertical line here. A uh, phase is, is an indication that we've taken a number of positions across um, across a certain span, and we're seeing uh, what's happening with one chromosome versus the other parent, um, and it's, it's consistent across all. Oftentimes, we don't really know. Uh, you know, it's coming from the maternal or the paternal chromosome. We call it unphased. It's coming from one or the other. But in small regions, where we're able to do local assembly. We're able to say you know, the same variants are happening on one versus the other. Um, and these representations are basically an indication of what alternates we're seeing. So in this case here, we're seeing uh, a, a call that um, um, the, basically the zero represents the reference. So the reference is being seen twice, okay? Um, here, uh, we're seeing both the reference and the alternate uh, expressed or shown uh, visible. Uh, and here, we're showing with a one one that's both cases is the alternate. Okay, what's coming up? Um, and I mentioned earlier that you may have multiple alternate alleles that are presented by numbers here as well. This is a, this is a lot of information. I'm giving you a quick kind of run through for it. Uh, but as you look at BC files, look at the specification. If you get you know you, you start exploring them, you'll understand a bit more. And the filter tags. Once we've run our variant caller, we will run another another tool called Mutech filter filter Mutech calls filter Mutech calls. Um, which will kind of do an assessment of the, qual the quality of the calls that we've made. It may just put a pass or a fail in there. It could put multiple values in that filter field. Again, coming up here, you see it's simply just pass for all of them. But it can put lots of other information in here indicating, usually what it's indicating is it's, it's either it's passed or it's not going to pass, but why am I not going to pass it? And lots of information. And that's useful 
uh, someone may come back and say, well, I think I'm expecting this type of you know, event to happen in here. I may still want to use that data. So it's trying to give you as much information you can, as possible about that, that you know, Carl, about that, about that variant. Okay, so that's the VCF file. We're almost to the point now of having this data ready to go into reporting. Um, we want to do one more thing. Uh, we want to take that variant, those, all those variants we've identified in the VCF file, and see if we can pull some information about what we think those are, the effects of that variance, those variants are on um, the genes that are associated with that. Okay, and we use a tool here called a Variant Effect Predictor. Uh, and that's in the exercises on how to run it. Um, what this does is it identifies lots of potential information that could be added to that VCF file. These are called consequences. Um, and I'm kind of showing a quick diagram here, lots of discussion detail on it here. Um, we're often very interested in things that are happening within the exons um, over here, um, plus like stop loss, things like that. Okay, that may indicate you know, changes in your gene expression. Uh, that result in those changes that happen in the genome. Um, okay, we'll come back to this when we, when we go through the exercises as well. Okay, so that's a quick run through of all, all the things we're going to do in the exercise, all the files we're going to generate. Um, I want to just kind of finish the, the, the lecture part of it to talk about uh, two additional things. Um, there are other formats that we work with. I've highlighted in red is the one we've talked about. Um, FASTQ files can be big. Uh, Illumina actually has a kind of proprietary uh, format for storing their sequence data called Aura. Uh, by proprietary, that means you have to pay for it. Um, but people are making use of that simply because they want to save space. Same with SAM and BAM files. The, the, you can blow up BAM, BAM compresses data. It's still big, and people are finding ways to compress it even more. Same called CRAM format. Um, we work with BED files, which describes genomic ranges. Um, descriptions of gene features uh, that are associated with the genome, either in a GFF or GTF format. As you work with data, you'll see these things. Segmentation data involved with copy numbers. Um, we mentioned VCF files. There's other ways to store variants, including MAP, which is something that's used by our clinical reporting. Um, and lots of other formats we commonly use. These aren't necessarily bioinformatics formats, but things that are generally used um, in, in, in coding and computer science and storing information. And finally, I just want to kind of talk about, you know, kind of the bigger picture. I showed you that big map of, uh, of, of, of the full pipeline. Uh, we really just focused in the exercises on generating somatic variants coming from the whole genome tumor normal pair, running it through a tool called Mutech2 um, and the variant uh, effect predictor, the annotator. Uh, but we're, that pipeline generates lots of other information, um, which I haven't included in the exercise, but, you know, Welcome to explore. I've indicated the tools that are used here. Um, looking for structural variants, larger deletions, um, uh, larger copy number variants, uh, translocations, inversions, kind of lots of strange things that happen in our genomes. Um, and the tools that we work with on those. Uh, copy number variation, which is a common thing to look at in terms of understanding um, uh, issues with uh, you know, whole, whole chromosomes being copied or regions of chromosomes being copied. Um, the tools we use for that. Uh, very important, especially in our clinical reporting, is looking at purity of the, the sample, um, employee estimates. Uh, we look at uh, MSI, microsatellite satellite instability, um, identifying gene fusions. There's also uh, our pipeline is a whole genome transcriptome pipeline. We're also looking at gene expression coming from the tumor as well, um, and looking at HRD uh, with a tool called HRD Tech. So lots of other tools are run on our data before we, we, we process it. Uh, before it gets to generating a clinical report, which again we'll pick up on later this afternoon. Um, 